So now we, we, we move on to our next session. Um, I'm going to invite the two moderators up here. The next session is around renewable gas, and the moderators of this session, and they can introduce themselves, is Jan uh, and Berent. Jan and Berent, would you care to come up? Yeah, good morning, everybody. I would also like to welcome you to this session on renewable gas here. We will have uh, four presentations now, and this will be followed by a coffee break, and then we will continue with a panel discussion where we would like to discuss how we can accelerate, actually, the deployment of renewable gas technologies in the market. The four presentations have changed a little bit, so we got on short notice uh, that the second presentation from Philip Lehmann will not take place today, so he fell sick and so he will not be able to present. But fortunately, we had somebody to jump in, and so Henrik Thunmann will give a presentation on the uh, Govigas project. I'm a little bit sad that we won't see that uh, presentation from Philip Lehmann because the uh, biomethane sector, as I experience it, uh, is uh, moving towards this CO2 liquefaction. So a lot of the projects I have uh, been seen discussed are now looking into this. This uh, seems to be the new uh, state of the art. So this is quite uh, sad, therefore, that we won't have this presentation of this large project in Switzerland. Uh, however, um, I would like to uh, introduce myself, maybe, at this point, <laughs> because I forgot. Uh, my name is Jan Liebetrau. I am um, the task leader of Task uh, 37 uh, within IEA Bioenergy. This is the task uh, energy from biogas, and as the name says, we are dealing mainly with biogas uh, originating from anaerobic digestion. And my colleague is dealing with gasification, and I will give you a chance to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. My name is Berend Vreugenil. I'm the task leader for Task 33 on gasification of biomass and waste, where we look into the applications of the gasification gas. And uh, so this, this uh, morning presentation round is about producing biomethane via digestion and via gasification and uh, topics related to that. So the first speaker, I think you will introduce him, uh, and then the next three speakers relate more to gasification, and then you will see me. Yeah, the first speaker will also give his pres presentation online here. This is uh, Robert Böhm. He is from large company Hitachi Zosen Innova Schmack. Uh, Schmack has been uh, not so large company in, in Germany, and they have developed a power to gas system, which uh, is based on a biological process. They are just about to commission uh, a large facility with this technology, and therefore we have invited him to introduce their technology, their solution for this uh, power to gas process. Robert Brim is responsible for marketing of, of this technology, and uh, we are looking forward to his presentation. Hello, good morning. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Jan, for this uh, uh, kind introduction and um, um, intro. I'm really pleased uh, to, to welcome you um, uh, as well. Um, it's an honor for me to um, present um, Hitachi Tsozi Innova and um, our solution for um, power to methane and uh, in particular biological methanation. I've prepared some, um, some slides uh, to give you um, uh, yeah, the information about, as, as you mentioned, um, power to gas project. And um, I hope you can already see my, my slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so at the beginning, uh, I would uh, take the opportunity to present um, Hitachi Zosen Innova a little bit. Um, as uh, Hitachi Zosen Innova is a um, Swiss Japanese uh, clean tech company with, with a headquarter in, in Zurich, Switzerland. And um, Hitachi has a um, broad, um, yeah, um, a broad range of, of solutions uh, for handling waste. 
Ähm, Hitachi Zosen in Noma is the market leader, leader for incinerator plants, so large uh, energy for waste um, plants. Um, but there are also further um, solutions um, for biogas uh, production, biogas upgrading, um, and, uh, and also power to gas applications. Um, Hitachi Zosen in Noma is um, acting globally with over 600 references worldwide and um, 80 years of, of experiences in the field of um, um, EPC uh, business. Um, and uh, at the moment, we are um, yeah, um, plus minus 1,600 uh, 100 employees uh, within uh, Hitachi Zosen Innova. Um, this picture shows um, the solutions we have within uh, the company uh, in, in, in the um, in the center, we have the um, large waste incinerator business. And then we have different solutions for, for um, biogas production. We have a proprietary solution for wet and dry ID. We have technologies for the upgrading of raw biogas, means uh, uh, amine scrubber solutions, membrane uh, technologies. We have also um, solutions for uh, CO2 liquefaction and um, methane liquefaction. And then we have the, the segment here of our power to gas solutions, where we have a proprietary um, um, electrolyzer technology. And what is quite unique is that we have two technologies for, for the methanation of hydrogen and CO2. Uh, we have a biological methanation and a catalytic methanation. And uh, the, the target of today's um, yeah, short presentation is to give you a further impression here about our biological methanation and, and the power to methane project um, we, we have. Um, to show you a little bit uh, the, the challenge we, we see also for renewable gases is um, that um, um, yeah, renewable gases can, can play an important role in, in, in the uh, energy transition. Yeah? Um, renewable gases can um, um, are, are needed uh, to, to meet the climate goals, to decarbonize um, gas-based energy sectors, and um, we must bring as much as uh, as much renewable gases into the grid as, as possible, also to diversify and secure gas supply. And there are different um, yeah, value chains or technical solutions to bring renewable gases into the gas grid or into into usage, and um, I think the methanation technology is a quite important puzzle piece here as we can use this catalytic and biologic methanation to either convert hydrogen from electrolysis together with CO2 into synthetic methane. And we can use this methanation technology also as a solution to, yeah, to treat zyn gases from gasification, pyrolysis and others and methanate them, treat them, and bring them into the gas grid. And um, uh, we as Hitachi Tsuzi Nova are focusing on these two types of projects uh, for our methanation um, technology. And um, um, in, in this presentation, I would like to highlight a little bit more the path here of, of, uh, yeah, of the biological methanation of, of raw biogas from uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, where we see the value proposition of the methanation. First value proposition is really to convert hydrogen into a synthetic methane. Yeah? There is also the second value proposition where we can use the methanation uh, technology um, in order to upgrade raw biogases, gases from wastewater treatment plants, or also uh, synthesis gases. Yeah? And, uh, use this biologic methanation as a technology to bring more renewable and especially biogenic gases into the grid. The methanation technology can also can be seen as a carbon capture and utilization technology as we can also use direct CO2 and uh, yeah, avoid um, direct CO2 emissions here with our technology by combining CO2 with hydrogen. And last but not least, um, we can use this um, biological and catalytic methanation as technology to do the, a seamless injection of methane into the existing infrastructure without 
ja, challenging the, uh, challenges for adjusting the existing infra infrastructure and devices, transport or storage infrastructure to, to hydrogen. So um, we see a huge advantage here for, for this uh, molecule of, of methane. And um, now I would like to um, give you a quick introduction into our biological methanation technology. Um, uh, in this process, we have hydro hydrogenotrophic archaea. These are microorganisms, and they convert hydrogen and CO2 into synthetic methane. These microorganisms, they are cultivated in this uh, uh, continuous steered pressure vessel. Uh, it's a um, reactor where we cultivate these microorganisms. They are very robust against trace gases that come from, um, from the feed gas. Uh, so, for example, um, against sulfur, ammonia, other trace gases that uh, are fed by, uh, by the raw biogas or the, the zin gas. Um, this biological methanation is also very dynamic and flex flexible. It's uh, designed for a more or less unmanned uh, operation here. It's uh, fully automated. And we can achieve a quite high methane concentration after this biological methanation process that can reach values up to 96, uh, 98%. Um, this uh, process here is an exothermic process where we, where we have surplus heat available around uh, 50 to uh, 65 degrees. Um, and by valorizing this heat, uh, quite high overall efficiency um, can, be, uh, can be achieved. This um, slide shows a little bit our technology roadmap and our upscaling roadmap. And it becomes clear that uh, in a very short time, we have developed a uh, technology from lab bench uh, and, and our lab pilots, uh, pilots um, to an industrial and commercial scale, where we can say that this technology of biological methanation is, is mature and ready um, at a TRL level of, let's say, eight to nine. And now it's up to, um, to start further commercial projects um, with a real business case. But from a technical, pers technical and technological perspective, we can say that this technology is, is mature and available for further projects. With this module standard here of our commercial size, we're able to produce uh, 100 cubic meters of uh, synthetic methane per hour and uh, to address higher throughputs of hydrogen and CO2, for example, um, it's easily possible to modulize these reactors uh, and uh, produce higher um, yeah, flows of, of synthetic methane. One project I want to highlight um, is uh, one um, yeah, very important project here we built for a customer in, in Switzerland. It's a so far largest power to methane project with biological methanation. Um, currently um, uh, built in, uh, in, in Switzerland, uh, in, uh, near uh, Zürich. And here the, the operator and owner is, is Limeco, it's a um, utility. And um, they have a, um, a location where, where they have a waste incinerator as source for renewable electricity. This incinerator is used, uh, um, or this power is used to, to produce hydrogen. And then the hydrogen, together with CO2 from a wastewater treatment plant here, is used to run the methanation. And this methanation combines the hydrogen and the CO2 and produces synthetic methane uh, and is also uh, able to, uh, uh, to upgrade the raw biogas from the wastewater treatment plant. And with, with this plant, uh, we are able to produce 200 30 cubic meters of renewable gas. And um, the overall capacity of this plant allows a production of 18 gigawatt hours of renewable gas. And this corresponds to a CO2 saving of between 4,000 and 5,000 tons of, of, uh, of CO2. Um, this is uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the setup here a little bit more in, uh, in detail. We have the waste incinerator that is a source of electricity. Then we use two and a half megawatt of, of electricity to run the electrolyzer for hydrogen production. 
And then we have uh, the wastewater treatment plant. We have, we have the raw biogas. This raw biogas is fed into this power to methane plant, and in particular the bioreactor. And uh, the CO2 and hydrogen is converted. And um, yeah, 200 cubic meters of renewable gas are injected into the gas grid. This is uh, the plant um, where we have the uh, PEM electrolyzer and the waste uh, the water treatment here of, of, of the electrolyzer. Then we have the bioreactor with a strong stereo on top. We have further downstream equipment for gas polishing and also further auxiliaries here in, in, in this building. This is a picture from the plant, uh, uh, the, the large building here uh, with a uh, electrolyzer and auxiliaries, electrical cabinets, etc. And then on the left hand side, you can see the bioreactor that converts hydrogen and CO2 from raw gas into synthetic methane. Um, this is a picture of the reactor, fully isolated, uh, so that we can use a surplus heat in a district heating network. Um, you can see the top of the reactor. Um, where we um, see the flange here and the piping for, for the biomethane um, product gas. Also further um, flanges here to dose um, uh, sludge and uh, further nutrients, trace elements needed for this uh, biological process. Here's a picture of this downstream gas upgrading uh, as the product gas after the bioreactor is with 100% vapor. There are also further um, trace gases uh, in in this um, uh, biomes or in this methane flow, and here we have further downstream uh, equipment to polish uh, the gas, to to dry it, to uh, res um, to remove sulfur and ammonia, and then um, the gas meets the requirements for downstream gas grid injection, and the flow of uh, 230 cubic meters of uh, renewable gas, one share of synthetic, one share of biogenic. And methane is injected into um, into the Swiss gas grid. Last but not least, I would like to show also a small um, demonstrator project here for our biological methanation, as we are involved in projects uh, um, where we have a, um, a zyn gas. In this case, it's uh, from pyrolysis. Uh, we have a biogenic waste here that is uh, uh, treated with a um, uh, pyrolysis, and then we have a um, gas mixture with, with hydrogen, CO, CO2, methane. And then it's uh, the question how to treat and methanate the syngas flow um, with a biologic methanation to have a quality after the methanation that can be uh, directly in injected into the, the gas grid. And this is a um, demonstrator or pilot project here. Um, this uh, small reactor is uh, commissioned uh, yeah, uh, during this, this year. And we are thrilled to see also uh, the results out of the biological methanation of, of zin gas in order to bring more renewable gases into the gas grid. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm pleased to, to answer your questions you may have. Given the time, I would like to allow one question, maybe from the audience. Is there any question here? Paul has a question. Thank you very much, Robert, for your presentation. I, I'd just like to understand, or uh, as far as I understood, you're producing 2.5 megawatts of renewable gas, but your input is 2.5 megawatts of renewable electricity. So how does the economics set up stand? What's driving the economics? Um, what is driving the economics? It, it's a good question. It's for, for this um, power to methane application. It's, uh, uh, let's say, it's uh, the ratio between uh, cost and revenues. So it's uh, the challenge, challenge to get cheap electricity uh, and then high uh, revenues for methane. And uh, with this plant, um, um, and, and the aspect that we are, have that we have two um, uh, use cases here by produces, producing synthetic methane and also upgrading raw biogas, uh, it, it's, uh, it sees, uh, it's it's possible to have such economic uh, case when you have cheap electricity and and uh, high revenues for for the methane. 
but it's quite challenging. You know. Yeah, I think we could continue this discussion for hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, we don't have time left. So I will hand over to Berend, and we are looking forward now to the gasification part of this session. Thank you. Yes, our next speaker is uh, one of my colleagues, Heather Ray from TNO. She's working in the, the bio based and circular technologies group uh, at TNO, um, dealing with pre treatment uh, work. And she will be presenting on our activities where we uh, focus on uh, upgrading complex or wet biogenic feedstocks in, in commodities that can be used either in gasification or combustion. Um, with that said, Heather, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Baron. And yeah, sorry I couldn't uh, be there but uh, very happy to uh, share some of the work we're doing at TNO related to uh, pretreatment of complex and wet biomass. Um, and so I'm going to talk specifically about our tor wash technology. Let me just uh, start my slideshow. <clears throat> so I'm going to discuss uh, tor wash technology, which was developed at TNO. Um, we're in the bio-based and circular technologies group, as was said, so we're really working towards um, defossilizing and moving towards a bio-based and circular economy, and we develop a lot of technologies to facilitate that. I'm going to also talk about uh, some of the current use cases for, for this technology, uh, including some examples from current uh, feedstocks and projects, and then also talk a little bit, uh, as was requested, about future prospects, including how it could be used as a pretreatment process. So what is tor wash? The name uh, gives a little bit of a hint. So the tor is, comes from torrefaction and wash uh, is, is washing. So uh, we can describe it uh, as a wet torrefaction process. And it really is to upgrade uh, biogenic waste streams, um, particularly these sort of difficult feedstocks that have a lot of water, so very wet feedstocks, or have a lot of salts in them. And so these types of feedstocks are often very difficult to dewater, difficult to dispose of, and they, of course, have a very low um, energy density. Uh, maybe you can't, uh, maybe they need further treatment before being discharged, for example. And so the goal with, uh, with the tor wash process is to convert these difficult uh, waste streams into fuel. So to really upgrade them and improve their, their energy density. So the concept um, is that tor wash, the, the conditions under tor wash modifies the surface product properties of the, of the solids. So tor wash was invented uh, at TNO by my former colleague, Jan Pels. And uh, the idea is that the biomass under these conditions becomes more brittle, fibers become more compressible, organics dissolve, and the salts uh, get washed out of, the, out of the solids into the liquid phase. So it's a hydrothermal treatment. And within a temperature range of 150 to 250 degrees Celsius in water. So the key here is that with these with this uh, improved uh, surface properties, the solids can be more efficiently dewatered. And as I said, the salts go to the liquid phase. So the process is also mild enough in terms of temperature that the um, liquid stream, after you separate the solids, can be digested to produce biogas. So this is how we typically use tor wash currently. So we have a wet biogenic residue, we tor wash it, and then that product is a slurry. It's very similar to what goes in. It's a slurry, it's a mixture of liquids and solids. And then we use a mechanical dewatering process to separate out a liquid fraction and solid cakes. At the solid cakes, uh, right now, we use it as a solid fuel, so uh, we maybe pelletize it or not, depending on the, the location and the application. And the liquid fraction, as I said, um, goes to anaerobic digestion to produce biogas. At TNO, we have a lot of different test facilities for tor wash. So first, uh, we do screening tests in very small autoclaves, uh, less than two liters typically. Then we can scale up to a 20 liter volume. 
We also have a, a mobile pilot plant, which is a continuous operation, unlike the lab uh, processes, which are batch. And so the pilot plant is where we do uh, a lot of our current work. And then we're also currently uh, constructing what we're calling a large pilot, uh, which is 500 kilograms per hour. And that's under construction uh, for use next year at a wastewater treatment plant here in the Netherlands. So one of the things that I find most interesting about this process is it's quite flexible. So it's not targeted to one specific feedstock. You can tailor the conditions to your specific feedstock and your specific desired output. But we've uh, looked at Torwash for a whole bunch of different feedstocks, mostly uh, sludges and agro food residues, which of course represent a huge uh, potential um, energy source and a huge. There's tons of residues from sludges and agro residues, so it's a logical. Um, target, but also uh, plantation waste, so empty fruit bunches, um, manure. We're doing a lot of work right now with manure, which is very topical in the Netherlands right now. Also drier feedstocks like grasses uh, from wetlands or from roadsides. There's also some work uh, with plastics, just for your information, and that's more on the end of life. So using the process to break down, to recycle um, both regular fossil-based plastics, but also bio-based plastics like uh, PLAs. So as you can see from this, most of what we're focusing on in terms of a product is fuel. So we really want to target dewatering and making a good quality fuel pellet. But of course, depending on the feedstock, sometimes maybe we can also get out some uh, nutrients as well, like phosphorus in particular, which tends to, um, tends to stay in the, in the solids. And the driving force, again, depends on the feedstock, but it's often, of course, related to improving um, the energy density or also reducing disposal costs, which can be very, um, very expensive for these difficult high volume waste streams. So as a pretreatment, this is interesting, and this is something we're exploring uh, more and more. Um, using Torwash to produce more of a clean uh, carbon source. Um, and so we're using the carbon then from Torwash, not maybe directly as a fuel, but as a feedstock for other processes downstream to produce um, advanced biofuels or chemicals or other products. And this is really important because for those processes like gasification or pyrolysis, it really allows us to broaden potentially um, available feedstocks to include some of these low quality residues. So here's an example of um, some of the pellets produced from tor washed grass and also reeds. So these are the fuel standards in the, in the red box on the left. And basically what this shows is that after tor washing and dewatering and pelleting, the pellets that we produce are very high quality and they conform to these, uh, these two fuel standards for a solid uh, biomass fuel. So that's from grass and from from reed. So as you can see, we don't have to add anything to it. So that's uh, that's interesting. Um, the bulk density meets the requirements. So we produce quite a dense uh, pellet with a higher calorific value. Um, and again, the salts, the chlorine, the potassium are washed, washed out of the uh, solids into the liquid fraction. <clears throat> Here's some examples from uh, some current projects. So one of the projects is uh, F-Cubed, which is a Horizon 2020 project, where we looked at uh, paper sludge, as well as some agro residues, which are in the next slide. Uh, and we tore washed it on site at the paper mill. So our feed was around one to 4% dry solids, and we were able produ to produce a cake of 40% dry solids. We could also recover phosphorus from the solids as a uh, struvite, and we also did some follow-up studies, uh, which is interesting, where we mix the solid uh, as a carbon source uh, with anthracite for a blast furnace injection in steel making. And that was published earlier this year, if, if that interests you. Um, so looking at different applications of the solids besides um, just as a fuel. And this really improved the dewaterability and the quality of the solids compared to their current process uh, without any dewatering aids or chemicals. So we're still calculating the actual impact, environmental and economic, but um, quite interesting results. And then we did some biogas uh, potential as well. So from an economic uh, perspective, 
it is feasible for, for uh, biogas potential from the liquid stream. Wastewater sludge, uh, also similar. So um, a cake of over 50% dry solids, most of the phosphorus ends up there. Quite a high biogas uh, potential in the liquid fraction. These are the other two feedstocks from F cubed. We look at orange peels and olive pomace. So this is sort of the agro uh, food residue streams. And again, depending on your feedstock, it varies, but we're seeing some nice results. So we see good pellets, um, the salts washing out, a higher energy density, um, and a good dewaterable solid, and a good biogas uh, production potential. But it depends on the feedstock, of course. So the olives have uh, quite a good um, energy density because there's oil in there, but then the oil also results in some let's say issues. Uh, so the pellets, for example, can be quite sticky. It doesn't pelletize very well. Um, it produced a lot of gas when we uh, combusted it, it almost like overloaded the, uh, the afterburner. So, you know, there's, you have to sort of tailor uh, a little bit depending on your feedstock. So next steps uh, for Torwash. So of course we, we continue our lab scale and our pilot scale tests with various feedstocks. As I said, we really wanna highlight the flexibility of the process in general. And so we want to continue to improve the flexibility and tailor conditions to different feedstocks and different products. So yes, of course, energy um, as a pretreatment as well. I think that's really interesting, but also it's biomass. There's a lot of good stuff in there. What sort of co-products can we also um, extract? F cubed uh, continues for another year with those feedstocks. So we'll have some interesting a final results of that compared to the to the reference case to highlight the flexibility and the benefits of the tor wash process. As I said, we're doing a lot for manure right now. Um, hopefully, we'll be doing some tor wash as a pretreatment of difficult uh, residues for pyrolysis applications to make pyrolysis oil. And there's a scale up, as I said, for sewage sludge, sewage sludge, excuse me, at a wastewater treatment plant here. And that's led by uh, a spin-off company called Torwash um, that spun out of um, TNO to scale up and commercialize this technology. So right now specifically for wastewater, but of course, um, lots of potential applications in the future. And we're also looking at some tests uh, with seaweed right now, which is kind of interesting and uh, yeah. So lots of, uh, lots of potential, I think, and good, good steps. So that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and Baron is there. So I'm sure he's also uh, willing to chat with you over the coming, coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. There are some questions from the chat. Okay. Are there first some questions from the audience? There's a, you have some time, I believe. Hello, Heather. Just a quick question. Maria Wellish from Canada. I, I saw on one of your slides you talked about the manure work and the elimination of nitrogen emissions. Can you elaborate yes. on that? Yes, I'm from Canada as well. So hi. Um, yeah. So we're do so in in the in the Netherlands right now. Uh, there's a nitrogen crisis. There's a lot of uh, nitrogen emissions, and most of them come from agriculture, and a lot of the agricultural emissions come from manure. And so we've done some testing at lab scale and at pilot scale, where we process the manure directly from the stable. So in doing so, we're eliminating ammonia emissions from, from the stable and from subsequent storage of that manure. And so the unique thing about the process for that is that you don't have to separate out the liquid and the solids. You just feed the manure in from the storage uh, underneath the stable, it's a slurry. We just feed it directly into uh, into the Torwash reactor, and we're getting um, getting a nice nice result. So the nitrogen, um, so that's the that's the key thing there is we're we're eliminating or we're reducing significantly the ammonia emissions from the stable, and then we produce uh, a Torwash slurry which we can dewater uh, easily. And then the nitrogen there is split, of course, between the solid and the liquid fraction, and it's mostly about 65% in the liquid fraction. And what's in the solids, um, 
tends to be more in the form of uh, nitrates, so it's available uh, for plants. Some, few, some testing uh, needs to happen, but we don't expect that it will result in any um, ammonia emissions when it's applied to, to the soil if, you, if it's applied as a, as a fertilizer. Okay, thank you. I thought I saw another hand. Hello, thank you. Florian Müller from TU Wien. Um, very interesting process. I would be interested in learning about the differences to hydrothermal carbonization, which seems very similar, but works at elevated pressure. And where do you see the advantages and disadvantages for your process might be? Yeah, it's very similar and we kind of use it, it is, depending on depending on the temperatures or the pressures that we applied, sometimes we, we call it uh, hydrothermal carbonization. Uh, as well, we've just you know coined it uh, a tor wash, but yeah, at, at its heart, we are producing hydrochar um, from our process. And if we apply more extreme uh, pressures or temperatures, then we have more char formed, basically. Then we have two questions from the chat. Okay. Um, the chat is actually exploding uh, right now. A lot of interest. Um, so one is the following. Um, excuse me, it's hard to keep track here. <clears throat> so does uh, Tor wash technology justify the extra need of energy and capital costs with an upgrade on the product quality or an improvement on further treatment? This is one. Then the other one, is there a difference of Tor wash to hydrochemical uh, carbonization? If so, what is the difference? And finally, about tar wash, uh, tar wash using manure and agricultural residues. Is it currently financially viable to collect these feedstocks? And what would a typical offtake agreement with farmers look like? Yeah, so I think the hydrothermal carbonization I, I addressed, it's, it's very similar depending on the, the temperatures and, and the pressures that we apply, which we can tailor a bit. That's basically um, what it is. Um, in terms of the agricultural or other feedstocks, is it justifiable? Is there a business case? Well, that depends, but yes, more and more. So for manure, for example, yes, there is a business case because of the nitrogen crisis and the costs associated with that, but also uh, tied in with the current energy crisis. If we can extract um, gas and if we can extract fertilizer, then that also ties into, into the business case. But there's also, of course, ecosystem services, which we don't typically apply value to. But in mitigating this nitrogen crisis and nitrogen emissions, there's also value in that. So it is of interest to, for example, the government who are responsible for making sure emissions uh, meet, meet uh, the guidelines. For farmers, that's a different story. And what that looks like, um, that's a good question because it is a technology. So the way that we kind of envision it is that for a for a very large farm, they would maybe have a dedicated installation and they would have someone operating it. It wouldn't be the farmer that would be operating the installation. Um, for smaller farms, then maybe you have a central um, a central facility where you know the farms within, I don't know, five, five or 10 kilometer radius can bring can bring their manure. But all those logistics and stuff, uh, of course, we still, that's ongoing, this uh, manure manure research. But I would say in terms of business case in general, it depends on the feedstock. So for example, for paper sludge, uh, the biological paper sludge from their wastewater treatment plant, this is a huge problem for them. This is their main residue stream. And they spend a lot of money uh, to dewater it. They use valuable fibers that they can use in their paper making process. They use uh, chemical dewatering aids as well, polymers or polyelectrolytes and um, coagulants. And they get um, a solid that's about 30% dry solids. And so this is part of what we're doing in F-cubed is the techno-economics and also the environmental impacts over the reference case, but it looks very promising just compared to what they're currently doing and what they currently can get from their dewatering process. But for some residues, yeah, maybe there's not um, as strong of a business case. It depends and it would have to be evaluated um, 
on a case by case basis to justify it. But it's not just economic, of course, it's also uh, environmental benefits as well. Okay, Heather, thank you for your uh, answers. I think uh, uh, Heather is available online and you can also ask me questions uh, after the session. Um, the next speaker is Marion Mailleux. She's the project manager um, at Angie, responsible for the Gaia project. Some of you might know this. This is a gasification-based project to produce SNG from dry uh, biomass and waste feedstocks. Um, well, Marion, I hope you're there. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well, or...? Yes. Great. Um, so, I'm glad to be here to present you the Gaia project, uh, even if I regret not being with you uh, today. So, um, the Gaia project is about producing biomethane or synthetic natural gas from uh, biomass and waste gasification. Um, so, I'm part of the research center of NG called Cryogen, uh, dedicated to renewable gas and energies, and we developed this project and um, and now we'll show you also that we are beyond the R&D project as we are in the industrialization phase. So in a few, few words, uh, the Gaia project um, main objective was to demonstrate the technical, economic and environmental viability of producing this biosynthetic natural gas from gasification. You can see here the different partners who contributed to this project. Uh, it was a more than 10 years project. Um, and we, the project uh, ended uh, at the end of last year, uh, December 2021. And one of the main goal of the project was to build and now operate uh, this um, unique demonstration plant that you can see here on the top of the slide. Um, which is at um, semi-industrial scale, and it's also an R&D uh, plant. Uh, I will explain it uh, after. Um, so this project um, had the, the support of uh, the French Environmental Agency uh, in France, ADEM, um, and uh, I would say it was co-founded by, by ADEM. <clears throat> so, the project um, aims to, to address several um, um, challenges, either techno, economic, and environmental ones. Uh, there are some of them uh, in this slide, but of course, there are not all of them. Um, so here you can see the, the production chain of uh, bio-SNG from uh, biomass or waste. So first you have the um, uh, feedstock procurement, then you have the gasification step, which converts the solid uh, biomass and waste into uh, a synthesis gas uh, called syngas. Then you have the syngas cleaning step uh, before methanation. And then the methanation step, which is a, an important one, in order to increase uh, the amount of methane into the gas, in the final gas. And then you have an upgrading uh, step, uh, which aim to uh, remove all the pollutants or um, undesirable uh, compounds uh, in order to inject this biomethane into the, the gas grid. So here you have some example of uh, challenges we, we addressed within this project. So for the feedstock, of course, we wanted to diversify the, the type of feedstocks in order to, to be as, as flexible as possible. Uh, for the gasification, we made some improvement of uh, um, an existing uh, process um, in terms of uh, syngas quality, efficiency, and also availability. Regarding the syngas cleaning, we have uh, developed several uh, innovation in order to either uh, lower uh, the capex and opex, but also reduce the environmental impact of this uh, uh, step of the process chain. Regarding the methanation, uh, it's uh, most of the uh, innovation we, we made during this project, we developed an innovative and competitive process, uh, which is uh, um, NG in-house technology. Um, and we are um, uh, industrialization, uh, industri industrializing also this, uh, this technology. I will show you uh, after. And um, here you can see the Gaia demonstration plants. 
So, um, as I said, uh, it's a unique um, plant because we either perform R&D um, work. So this platform is highly equipped in, in terms of sensors, analyzers, and so on, in order to optimize the process chain at every step uh, of the process. And on the other end, it's a demonstration plant at semi-industrial scale. So it was designed uh, also to be to represent uh, an industrial environment. So the platform is uh, highly automated. Um, so um, we control the process from this building uh, where you have the control room. You can see here the, the control room. Um, and uh, here you can see also some of the different equipments we have uh, on the on the plant. So um, all of them are in this area, which is the technological area. Uh, you have the feedstock storage and preparation uh, units, uh, which are here. Um, then you have the gasification reactor, which is the fastest, fast internally circulating fluidized bed. Um, we are uh, under a atmospheric pressure and we are working with steam as we want to produce uh, biomethane. Uh, so we want to avoid uh, nitrogen introduction into the gas. So the gasification is here, but also in this section, you have uh, the sting gas treatment unit and also the uh, methanation uh, reactor um, in this uh, section. <coughs> so the first um, main result of the project was to um, ensure a sustainable supply of uh, and, and diversify as much, as much as possible the feedstocks. Um, so here you have several examples of feedstock. Uh, either we have already tested or we will uh, test in, uh, um, like in this year or in the coming years. So um, at the beginning, we started the project with lignocellulosic biomass. So we have demonstrated the process chain with uh, woody residues um, such as wood chips, or pellets or a mix with barks also, and also some agricultural residues such as uh, straw. Uh, and uh, I would say that two, um, two years at the end of the project, before the end of the project, we moved to uh, non-hazardous waste uh, such as solid recover fuels uh, derived from landfilling. And uh, in this way, we, we made a, a work premiere by uh, demonstrating at uh, TRL7 uh, that we can produce also a substitute of natural gas from this type of waste. Um, so we are still um, performing tests on the, on the platform to diversify as much as possible the feedstock, either um, including uh, wood waste uh, from, uh, for instance, demolition wood and, and so on. Um, I have to be very quick on the on the result, but it's hard uh, for a ten years uh, project. But um, the second result is about sin gas cleaning. So the um, the process uh, chain we we have uh, developed and tested showed very good result as we obtain a very high uh, sin gas quality uh, before um, methanation. So um, the syngas cleaning uh, process chain is um, contains the sing, uh, two syngas scrubbers uh, with biodiesel, which is re regenerated, and also uh, some uh, activated carbon base and uh, a, a guard too. So here are two graphs. Uh, I, I won't be. Uh, I will go into details, but uh, uh, on the left you have the uh, light tars, which are uh, benzene, toluene, and so on. And also on the right, you have the uh, H2S, which is one of the main uh, pollutants, uh, inorganic one. And on the two graphs, you can see that um, before sink gas cleaning, we have a different level of, uh, of pollutants depending on the feedstock. So either uh, uh, wood chips or a mix of wood chips with, with straw or also with bark. And on the right, in green, it's solid recover fuel. So you can see you have we have higher uh, pollutants from this waste, uh, either for BTEX and also HOS. But each time you can see that downstream the syngas cleaning, we have a very pure uh, syngas, uh, either for uh, lighters or for H2S. 
Um, the third result is uh, that the, we demonstrated that our in-house uh, metanation technology um, was very uh, flexible and, um, and very uh, efficient. Um, so I will detail this uh, technology uh, after, um, but in, in few words, uh, we demonstrated that this technology is compliant to highly convert uh, syngas from gasification, but also CO2 uh, sources from either industrial processes or, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, biogas uh, plants. Um, I will show you more details after. Um, and the um, last results, I will also show you um, uh, more details uh, results, but we also demonstrate within the, this project that we produced a high quality uh, biomethane or SNG, which is uh, totally compliant with, um, for instance, existing uh, European standards for biomethane uh, to be injected into the grids or uh, used as uh, biofuel uh, for so in replacement of uh, NGV. Uh, and also with um, French, a specific French uh, gas grid spe um, requirements to, to be injected into the grid. So here you can see the uh, methanation reactor we developed. Um, I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. So um, here it's a 3D modeling, and uh, you can see how it works. Um, so basically, the catalyst is fridalized. Uh, it's a bubbling fridalized bed. Um, and while uh, while it's uh, fridalized, uh, the um, heat transfer and uh, also the, the reaction are highly intensified. And so we only require one uh, reactor to, com to reach the maximum conversion for syngas or CO2. Mm -hmm. Why, for instance, for syngas, the uh, of the shelf technologies are uh, several um, adiabatic uh, fixed bed reactors in series. And so it, uh, it takes a, a high footprint and also it's a high cost. So uh, here you can see that we really uh, mitigate the cost and, um, and the footprint. And there are also other advantages for this uh, technology. So uh, we are also operating at low pressure um, while other uh, the chef's technologies are operating at more than 10 bars. We are operating at lower than um, uh, five bar. Uh, also, it's a highly flexible um, reactor in terms of flow rate. So we can operate either from 25 to 150% of the nominal uh, flow rate. So it's a, a high advantage, more particularly for power to gas um, projects. Also, uh, the reactor has a, a very high um, reactivity. Uh, we, when we change the um, operating conditions, we stabilize um, the conditions very quickly uh, below 30 minutes, and we do not see any change in terms of uh, biomethane or, or synthetic natural gas at the outlet of the reactor. And one of the main topic also is the, is the catalyst that we, we developed, uh, which, shows, uh, which showed very, very high performances. We haven't any elutriation. We haven't changed uh, since more than uh, 100,000 hours of uh, operation on, on Gaia, uh, the catalyst, so it's highly performant. Uh, quick results on this uh, methanation. So first slide is about uh, syn gas methanation, and then it's uh, uh, CO2 methanation. Um, so here on the left, you can see that uh, this reactor uh, has an excellent uh, exothermicity management. Uh, you can see here the uh, temperature and here uh, the elevation of temperature uh, from uh, the gas diffuser uh, at the bottom of the, of the reactor. Uh, and so you can see that we have a... Um, less than 20 Celsius degree, but sometimes we had 25 Celsius degree of uh, mm, temperature difference within the reactor, which is very, very good. Um, and on the right, you can see some results of um, syngas conversion. Uh, here I just put um, example of SNG quality uh, in terms of um, minor, uh, 
major uh, components. Um, so what is important for the methanation is the H2 to CO ratio. Um, and you can see that uh, either in an unfavorable condition with a very low uh, H2 to CO ratio, for instance, of uh, 0.6, uh, to uh, what we uh, usually produce at uh, 1.5 um, H2 to CO ratio, you can see that we reach each time the maximum conversion of, uh, of carbon monoxide and uh, we have a very, very um, deviation from equilibrium, which is the maximum conversion we can expect. So it shows that the the methanation technology we have developed is very flexible in terms of steam gas quality or H2 to CO ratio and can adapt to uh, several gasification technologies, uh, not only the, the technology we, we tested on the Gaia platform. And regarding CO2 methanation, so I won't be long because you can uh, click here and, and see uh, the article uh, we published um, last year. Uh, about um, um, a parametric study uh, on this reactor, also in the condition of H2 to, uh, and CO2 uh, methanation. And we show also that uh, the reactor has a very uh, high uh, efficiency. <coughs> and um, finally, regarding the uh, SNG quality. So here you can see that we obtained a very high uh, SNG quality from uh, this uh, plant. So on the on the left you have the the main components of uh, the SNG we produce, and on the right you have a table regarding the uh, pollutants uh, within the uh, SNG. So on the left you can see that. Um, we uh, we respect uh, the either the uh, European standard uh, 16723 uh, uh, um, for biomethane. Um, either to part one is uh, for a um, biomethane injection into the gas grid, and the uh, part B of this European standard is regarding the uh, uh, fuel specification for motor vehicle. So you can see that uh, we respect uh, this uh, specification and also the French gas grid specification. More particularly, we have a very, very low content of uh, carbon monoxide. Um, and we also reach uh, below 2% of uh, hydrogen uh, content into the, the gas. And on the right, so you have um, some example of categories of uh, pollutants we, we anal analyzed. We perform an analysis on more than uh, 100 compounds. So here it's just a, a summary. But uh, you can see uh, that we also respect uh, the um, specification for some of these pollutants into the standards. <coughs> So it shows that uh, um, synthetic natural gas production from gasification can uh, be injected and uh, avoid uh, any uh, mod modification into the infrastructure in order to transport and distribute it um, and then to be used by uh, final uh, end users. So what's, uh, what are the next steps? Um, so right now we are in the industrialization phase so Gaia was really the, um, the bridge uh, between the lab uh, concept and now the industrialization. So the industrialization started in 2020 uh, and uh, we foresee the first industrial uh, uh, plant uh, in France, in the north of France, uh, uh, in uh, close to Le Havre uh, at Herb Arbor. Um, so the name of the project is Salamandre. And you see that uh, we will uh, scale up the process uh, from uh, 0.4 megawatts on Gaia to 20 megawatts uh, for Salamand. And uh, regarding the Gaia uh, plant, so of course we delivered the, the results uh, for the first industrial, uh, industrial plant, but we are also, um, this uh, platform is dedicated to um, develop uh, green gas. So we, still want to um, uh, collaborate uh, at European level or at national level uh, with um, partners uh, in order to continue to diversify the feedstock for the gasification sector. 
Uh, also, to diversify the application downstream, the gasification can be hydrogen or um, everything uh, that's possible with syngas. <coughs> we offer also uh, environmental, uh, uh, sorry, some industrial um, trial on the environment um, for, for instance, startups and uh, uh, small uh, companies or uh, higher companies in order to prove their technologies on the real gas. Um, and also we offer some services in order to de-risk uh, future industrial projects. Uh, for instance, we test specific feedstock for, uh, from uh, territories. So we have, uh, for instance, two projects right now with uh, uh, SRF and uh, Bwood producer. Um, and also we offer training and expertise uh, services, either for green gas process or analysis. And uh, finally, also, we continue to, to communicate a lot and uh, disseminate um, the knowledge uh, within the, the scientific or non-scientific community. So we organize of a lot of visits and uh, we also supply national or, or European working groups for the development of uh, renewable gas sector from uh, gasification. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. If there is one urgent question, because we are running a little bit over time, then uh, I would allow that. Elias has a question. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, for the presentation. Uh, a couple of short questions. First, what is the carbon gasification efficiency for FICFB gasifier used? And can you a little bit uh, elaborate on uh, removal of uh, colorine because I expect that uh, SRF includes uh, colorine. And if you use uh, activated carbon guard, I, I believe that that uh, activated carbon can absorb a lot of uh, heavy metals and it's quite poisonous. What do you do for, to handle uh, the activated carbon? Thank you very much. So regarding the carbon conversion efficiency, actually in the first version we demonstrated, uh, we are at like like the state of the art, uh, not nothing better than the, what the Gobai Gas project did. Uh, that wasn't the goal of the of the project uh, actually, um, but we we reach we we only convert. Um, I think it's between uh, around thirty percent of the uh, carbon. Uh, into biomethane because we have still remaining CO2 from um, the uh, separation with uh, biomethane and also from uh, flue gas. But we are also investigating how to convert this CO2 in uh, either additional uh, synthetic natural gas or in other uh, uh, molecules in order to increase the carbon uh, conversion efficiency in the next uh, version, I would say, of the, of the process. Uh, regarding the chlorine, um, actually we mainly, no, I would say we uh, remove all, almost all of it uh, in the scrubbers. So it's uh, it finish in the in the condensate we have from the scrubbers. <clears throat> and regarding the heavy metals, uh, most of them due to the um, uh, what we applied within the gasifier handed into the ash we have, but also uh, partly removed uh, into the scrubbers and partly removed into the activated carbon. And the activated carbon uh, step we have, we regenerate the activated carbon beds and the activated carbon beds, uh, the, um, sorry, the, uh, the gas uh, from this uh, regeneration and uh, ends into the combustor. So it's uh, um, finally the, the heavy metal are in the flue gas treatment unit. So we mostly re uh, recover the heavy metals in the either the ash uh, or the um, over steps of the uh, flue gas treatment units. Okay, thank you, Marion, for this question, which brings us, uh, I think, to the last. Speaker of the, this session, which is Henrik Tuman. He is the head of the vision and professor in the Department of Space, Earth and Environment, Energy Technology, 
at Chalmers University in Gothenburg, also a long name. Uh, and he is well aware of everything that happened with the go-by-guess uh, technology. He uh, studied it quite a lot and he can, uh, I think, tell us a lot of nice stories about this technology. I hope the presentation uh, comes on screen. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much, Bernd, for the introduction. And um, as he uh, was introduced, I was uh, responsible for the academic evaluation and also for the uh, training of personnel for uh, the Goodbye Gas project. So for those who are not familiar with the project, it's, uh, it's actually going back quite far in Gothenburg in the 90s where the air pollution problem, the city went for uh, having uh, gas buses in order to get rid of the diesel buses to improve gas quality or air quality in the, in the town. At that stage, they go for the fermentation and, uh, and um, they look on all available uh, substrate in the area. At the same time, Aeon in the south of Sweden also did the same thing. Late 90s, all the substrate was more or less finished. That was uh, sufficient for upgrading to biomethane. And at the same time, Gothenburg went for uh, uh, having a natural gas heat and power plant. And at that, this decided uh, that the uh, city energy company should produce equal amount of uh, uh, sustainable gas as they were using in this plant. And that was around one terawatt hour a year. So that was p pointing out that they needed to find ways to produce one terawatt hour of synthetic natural gas in the area of Gothenburg. And that should be done by the year 2020. And that was an ambitious goal at that time. They went out and asked if there were anyone who supply a synthetic natural gas plant from biomass in the 100 megawatt scale. And they get none bidders at the time. And then they have to design the process by themselves. And what they did then was that they started out or have the idea of having a demonstration commercial plant in the 20 megawatt scale and with very high biomass to bio, uh, bio, uh, mass to bio methane efficiency and also a very high energy target on the overall and also operational targets then. This plant had the ambition then to be part of also the commercial operation, which would then be the 100 megawatt, which will be next built in the second step. So all of the 20 megawatt plant was designed in order to be operated in parallel with this one. So the idea was that they should operate the 100 megawatt uh, plant on something they knew, and if there was something they didn't know, they could go to the 20 megawatt plant and test it, and before it was introduced into the 100 megawatt plant. So the first demonstration was up and uh, running, and it was up and running between 2014 and 2018. Uh, Due to the next, which I will show in the next slide, the economical reason, reason the, they, they didn't go for the next step, the 100 megawatt plant. So that, those plans was cancelled during 2015, but the uh, demonstration was continued. So the plant was built on the target of, on 80 euro per megawatt hour SNG, and that was mainly for transportation fuels. And uh, the target and, and the design of the the system, we, as the biomass was around uh, 7.5 euro per megawatt as received. Uh, one find out that if you build a 100 megawatt plant, you will reach this level. And that was also shown in this project that if you upscale the, the technology chosen, we will they will have meet that target. But what happens during this time was two things. They in introduced the green certificates which meant that you could sell green gas on the market. And that was used by the, in the Danish system. The Danish, they built big fermentation and used it to sell it to the um, Swedish market. And 
the uh, biomass or biogas price dropped to around uh, 30 euro per megawatt hour. So that was the first big blue to the project. But the big, really big blue for the project was uh, the HVU. HVU, because the Sweden and Finland imported more or less all animal fat and vegetable oil they can find from Southeast Asia. And they put it into the refineries and they could build then a technical units that was uh, paid back within three months. And then take away the, the benefit of using biogas in the transport sector. And on top of that comes the electrification, and that was then the end of the, the second step. But the interesting thing is that going up to what E.ON also had around 200 megawatt scale, you have some sort of sweet spot where you can reach and produce SNG and advanced biofuel as, as very uh, competitive cost if you compare to today's conditions. This is the plant, and now I saw this was coming in the last. The plant built as the same as the Gaia project of an indirect gasifier, and it was developed from the Repotec, even side. And so you have the root, the biomass comes into the gasifier. It goes through a first cleaning process, uh, the scrubber, the carbon beds, and then you have the compression. And here you have chosen the compression in order to also match um, the heat and energy demands. Because if you go up to the, the 16 bar that they did here, it match the SNG that go out on the, on the grid. You also lower significantly the cost for taking out the CO2. And the third thing is that you, the more or less all methanization taking place can take place at 550 degrees, meaning that you can take a big use of that heat in the heat integration and increase the efficiency overall, the overall project. Then you have the upgrading of the methane, and in the Swedish gas grid, we only have one supplier. We had a very high um, uh, requirement on this grass, more than 98% uh, methane, no CO2, more or less, or on PPM level, and you're allowed to have some uh, hydrogen, no CU. So that meant that they have to build uh, uh, three steps of uh, the final methanization to meet this, and have a very, uh, also what is coming out, that you need to dehydrate to take away all water to make it fully dry in order to get it out on the grid. So if I go and also the, the flue gas is here, is also one of the made part and one of the why this type of technology can be of advantage, is that you have a combustion unit. And the combustion unit take away more or less of all of your problem because it's the waste incinerator for the plant. So all residues and so coming out, you run through the uh, combustor and decontaminate it. So the flue gas cleaning, or flue gas, was it's a regular part. And um, the gasifier and the first cleaning steps was, what you can see, the demonstration here. If you come to the second part here, which is the methanization, this was not a big deal. Here you can find several uh, uh, providers, and they chose Halde Topse for this one. They build this 20 megawatt in Sweden and one 10,000 megawatt from coal in China at the same time. So the world's smallest and biggest of this technology. This plant, I can say that it was put up in time to the exact cost. And they were planned to have three weeks of uh, taking up of the technology. It was taken up with less than a more, little more than two weeks. It's designed for six years continuous operation. And that they promise, and they can prove that they can do it. And this is also when you come back to the cost. This uh, or methanization unit is, will always operate as long as you can provide gas to it. And this is what's giving economy to this. It's better to have uh, uh, euro per year than euro per hour if you 
that they have of these many technologies. So this is what I say is a very commercial and very uh, competitive type of technologies if you go for a life cycle economic analysis. In the project, we also look on possibility to inject hydrogen. And here Statkraft was coming with containers with electrolyzer, they thought anyway. And then they realized that uh, the subsidy schemes in Sweden and Norway was different and there were no economy to place the uh, electrolyzers there. But from a technology point of view, it was no problematic. It's just that you reduce the outtake of CO2. And that will also increase the overall efficiency of the plant. So it was straight out put to put in and make uh, methane more or less of 90, 95% of all the carbon going into the plant. If you look on the gasification technology, uh, we have two routes here. We have the, the now we call it the, the Repotec and the, from the, here from TU Vienna, which is coming from Gissing, Obert and Senden, which has the target of below 50 megawatt uh, heat, and dist, heat and power district uh, plant. And they have a specific design and, and do it for that. Then we have the parallel design, which was done in, in Gothenburg here at, at Chalmers at our university, and in Yokohama with AIH. AIH I heavy machinery, which also made a demonstration in Kuyan and in Gothenburg it was the same. These reactors on the gasification scale is designed for large scale operation and they can be built. And IHI also now off will offer this in the 100 megawatt plus scale. So I would say the technology also that is we had at the Chalmers unit, you can build two, three hundred. 400 megawatt is dependent on how much feedstock you can find. But if you build it, you should match the methanization. And to do that, you should build the gasifier in at least two to three, perhaps even four parallel, and then have methanization as single. Because the a solid fuel converter will have a maintenance stop with each. 12 to 18 months. You will not be able to build it for a longer period. So you need to build and plan for having uh, this. The methanization plant can go down to 20% of full capacity. So you can, and that is what you have to balance with. How to put the gasifiers in the system and have matching this. If you go for the methanization plant in China, they have, if I remember right, they have like 40. Four, five, four, 250 to 500 megawatt cool gasifiers feeding one methanization unit. So if we take what is the real big uh, uh, technology advances that was made in this product and as well as here in, 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 in Vienna and in, in Austria, it was the learning on that the tar is not the problem. If you build them in in a big scale, tar is not the problem for biomass gasification. You can handle it, and what you need to handle and what you need to, to steer is the calcium, potassium, and sulfur balance inside of the gasifier. If you do it, it operates, and it operates finally without any clogging and whatsoever problem. And this is what a scheme that was implemented into the Guba gas plant, and in the end, it was uh, you added sulfur, a sulfur gram per hour. You say it was ton, six ton of biomass an hour, and we maybe introduced 10 gram of sulfur. And then you have potassium carbonate was the other that you balanced it with. And this was in, introduced in, into the control system and it was automatically controlled, keeping um, the gas quality out from the gas fire at given condition at all time. So, with this I give some introduction of the product and what, the, what, what we actually did manage during this period.
I would allow one more question before we go uh, for a break. So if there is a urgent question, or you can tackle uh, Henry during the break, of course. I don't see any fingers. Then I would say uh, we go for a break now. Uh, the scheduled time to reconvene is uh, 15 minutes past 11. We continue with the, uh, the panel discussion. Uh, so be here, be on time, and uh, enjoy your coffee now. Thank you.